All right, good morning. We're going to get started. Um, we had a uh, last minute cancellation from our scheduled pastor, but uh, Councilman Larry McAtee has. Uh, agreed to deliver our invocation uh, this morning, and then uh, following that, why don't we have uh, Councilwoman, did you do it last time? I think so. Okay, how about Councilman Mark Stunsifer? would you lead us in the pledge? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before your throne of grace. Thank you for the way that you answer our prayer. Thank you for the way you have blessed Oklahoma City over the years the leadership and the citizens working together. May this morning be another example of that as we do your business. May our words and our actions be pleasing to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name for the way you provide for us. Amen. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. All right, I call this meeting of the City Council to order, and we have a relatively light Office of the Mayor agenda, but uh, we do have something, so I will head down to the podium. Why don't we start with uh, the lighter item. It is the custom, can I get my uh, ghost dog up here? It is the, uh, this is one of the stranger things I've done yet as mayor. President's pardon turkeys, I'm going to issue a proclamation to a skeleton of a dog. So um, it is the custom here at City Hall for the mayor to proclaim the night that we as a community will participate participate in the annual trick-or-treat tradition and so we have a proclamation to that effect and it is also the custom that the parks department occasionally accompanied by this little guy tramp will uh will accept said proclamation uh would the clerk please read whereas halloween is the time for jack-o-lanterns and annual appearances of ghosts goblins and strange and mysterious creatures Whereas our city's children celebrate Halloween by dressing in costumes and visiting homes in their neighborhoods to receive traditional holiday treats. The annual Halloween activities provide an opportunity for people in our community to become better acquainted. Whereas it is important to our community that children be allowed to enjoy these traditional activities, but that measures be taken to ensure the safety of the children and protect the rights of the homeowners. Now, therefore, David Holt, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim Wednesday, October 31st, as trick-or-treat night in Oklahoma City, and he encourages children and adults to cooperate in limiting the time of activities to the afternoon and early evening hours that households indicate their willingness to welcome their neighbors by turning on their porch and exterior lights, that youngsters only call on homes so lighted and he asks the cooperation of all citizens, young and old, in making this a happy and safe occasion for all. All right, well, very good. Well, we are joined by Melinda McMillan from Parks Department, who, who has nothing to say, but will <laughs> gratefully accept this proclamation, and we wish everybody to have a great Halloween night this year. Thank you for bringing Tramp with you as well. All right, on a far more serious note, I would like Joanna Eldridge to join me up here. <coughs> So, Joanna, you are, pending the vote here, you are our Teacher of the Month, and uh, we are so grateful for all that you do. We're going to learn a little bit more about you, but it appears that this does not cover, I think, the most interesting thing, which is that you came to Oklahoma City, uh, specifically Oklahoma City University from Poland about 11 years ago. Um, and we're going to hear more about your professional career as a teacher, if the clerk would please read this resolution. Whereas Joanna Eldridge has been named Teacher of the Month for October, by the Oklahoma City Public Schools and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. 
Joanna is a graduate of Oklahoma City University where she received her Bachelor of Music in 2011 and her Master's of Music in 2013. She is currently pursuing her Master's of Education at the University of Central Oklahoma. While attending OCU, Joanna taught piano and French horn lessons for six years. And during her last three years there, she worked with a student with multiple disabilities, which set the course for her career path in special education. Whereas Joanna is in her fifth year teaching in the Oklahoma City Public Schools, all at Edgemere Elementary School, where she works with pre-K through sixth grade students, receiving special education services in reading, English language arts, mathematics, and direct instruction in adaptive and social skills. Since 2016, Joanna has been serving in the role of lead mentor teacher, supporting her colleagues' teaching practices in all academic areas, as well as in behavior management, positive behavior intervention strategies, and response to intervention process and procedures. Whereas to help her special education students learn coping skills, Joanna has implemented a meditation class. This will assist her students in the general education classroom and will improve their ability to learn and develop healthy relationships with peers and adults, both at school and in life. Whereas Joanna is working closely with El Sistema to provide students with disabilities the opportunity to participate in symphony orchestra while receiving private music lessons. She has found that students with disabilities who are in the program are not only progressing academically, but also socially and emotionally. Whereas Joanna believes that being a teacher is an amazing and extremely powerful task, and that teachers can change a child's life tremendously and have an everlasting <laughs> impact. Now therefore be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend Joanna Eldridge on her selection as October 2018 Teacher of the Month by the Oklahoma City Public Schools and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. All right. Well, that was uh, a great wrap-up of your career and all that you do for our community, and we're very grateful. We now have to have a vote on this, however, to see if you are really going to be the Teacher of the Month. And I believe Councilman Shadid, she is your constituent. Would you like to make a motion? Okay. Got a motion and a second. Uh, if everyone would cast your votes. Passes unanimously. You are the teacher of the month. Let's show it right. um, would you like to say a few words? We would love to hear from you. It looks like you, wow, you have prepared remarks. That's unique. I promise I'm not Snapchatting. I just have some notes. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and Mayor Holt. Um, I'm pleased and humbled and honored to receive this award, and I would like to say thank you to everybody who voted on that. And nominated me for that award. Um, my mission in teaching is to spread a um, vision that education can be a way to open many doors to many opportunities and that's what I lived by and that's what my father taught me and that brought me across the world all the way here to spread that love and that mission. So I'm going to continue in this amazing city of Oklahoma City and thank you again so much for this award. Thank you. Let's show our appreciation again to Joanna. You yours to keep. Thank you so much. All right, I'll make my way back to the, my seat. That concludes Office of the Mayor, which takes us to item four on our agenda, the council, Journal of Council Proceedings. I would entertain a motion. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That takes us to item five, request for uncontested continuances, and we already have on here 9A. Uh, Mr. City Manager, are there any others? Just a few on page 19, under 9M1, 9M1, page 19, item B, 4000 South Brookline, we ask to strike that item, the owner is securing. Uh, item F, 4713 South Santa Fe, we ask that that be stricken, the owner secured. Item H, 620 Northwest 28th Street, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item M, 736 Southeast 41st Street, we ask that that be stricken, 
the owner has secured moving to pay or still, still on 19 item 9 n1 a 4000 south brookline we ask that that be stricken the owner secured item f 620 Northwest 28th Street, West of Debbie stricken, the owner secured. And finally, item I, 736 Southeast 41st Street, West of Debbie stricken, again, the owner secured. Okay. All right, moving on to item six, revocable permits. We have item A, revocable right of way use permit with Capitol Hill Main Street to hold Haunt the Hill. Is there anyone here to speak on that matter? If not, uh, Councilman Stone? Uh, thank you. I would move for approval. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 6B, revocable right of way use permit with downtown OKC to hold brick or treat. Is there anyone here to speak on that? So, I know the play on words here, but it kind of sounds like if you don't get a treat, we're going to throw a brick through your window. But uh. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Riley Cole. I'm with Downtown Oklahoma City Partnership. We're hosting our fifth annual Brick or Treat Candy Hunt next Monday, the 29th, from 4 to 7, and requesting to close down Mickey Mantle just from alley to alley, Flaming Lips to Wanda Jackson. Very good. We've got a motion from a uh, motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great event. All right, we'll recess the council meeting and convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority where we have items A through E. I would entertain a motion for all of them. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority where we have items A and B. I could take them all in one motion. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We will adjourn the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. Convene as Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. All we have there is claims and payroll. We probably don't have to vote, but let's do it anyways. Is there a motion? Okay. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust and reconvene as the council meeting where we find ourselves on page three of your printed agenda with the item seven, the consent docket. We've got a motion and a second, and I know we have a presentation on AO. That's the only scheduled presentation, right? Yes, sir. And is there any other council member who'd like to pull out any item for discussion? Or I have a question on T. T, okay. And then uh, just a comment on AG. T and AG, okay. Anyone else? All right, well, we'll take them in order, which brings us to T. Uh, T is um, the, uh, the ballpark field replacement. I was the only question is how often do we do that? I'm not sure if we've done it before or not. Okay, uh, we don't do it often. Well, and, <laughs> and 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 then that that leads me into, you know, that we just had a monster truck rally and bull riding on yes. the field. Yes, and it was I was. Curious, so like, is this really gonna? It seems like this is gonna destroy the field. And that was okay because this is because yeah, we're, right. This yeah. Year we're, we're, we're replacing. So, the so we're not gonna have that same event next year. <laughs> I, hope, hope I would think not. I would think the Dodgers a, probably wouldn't want yeah, that. But I think this is the first time on the roof and it's the first time on the field too. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No, they they specifically scheduled that because they were doing this. So it was a, okay. I hope you made it because it was a once a generation opportunity. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A G. That was you as well, Council. Yeah, AG is, uh, we're approving an allocation of $1.7 million in funds from the 2007 GEO bond uh, for improvements to um, Piedmont Road or State Highway 4. Uh, this is a, an area that has had an, a number of accidents and a, a lot of them have been fatal accidents and so uh, it is a cooperative agreement between the city of Yukon, uh, Oklahoma City, and um, ODOT. So it's an ODOT project, but our portion of the project is 1.7 um, million, and it's mainly for uh, getting uh, um, right away and relocating utilities. And it does say Ward 8, but it is Ward 1. So that's it. Mayor, I forgot to uh, mention AE, and okay. if I could follow on on that, because Eric's here. Mm -hmm. This is a similar project. Um, 
on uh, Northwest 10th Street uh, between Pennsylvania and May, and it's an, uh, a partnership project along with ODOT, 2007 bond issue. It looks like our share is about 1.2 million, expected to begin in spring of 19. Eric, does this involve um, cleaning up that intersection at Virginia and Penn as well, or is that a separate project? I need to look at that and get back to you to be sure. Um, but this is an ODOT project, so as we continue to work with them, I can get some additional details and get that reported back to you. Okay, I, I think the cleanup of the intersection may be in the 17 bond issue. I believe that's also correct, and there's some things that we have done in the past year to try to redo some of the striping and some of the confusion that occurs at that intersection, but I don't know if this project does in addition to what maybe what we've tried to address this past year map might be what's in that bond okay. as well. This is also an intersection where we're having some really serious issues with tents and camps and yes. and so I would hope that maybe holistically as we look at this we might be able to address some of those issues as well. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, well, that leaves us with AO. Now, this item was deferred from the last meeting. This was, uh, as if I could distill the discussion, it was in the interest of not considering um, the river request in a vacuum, but looking at what the whole totality of uh, requests for the MAPS 3 overage money includes. And so uh, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. City Manager, to provide that information. Thank you. Before you today, uh, we have a copy of a presentation that was given to the council probably five or six weeks ago. Uh, and it was given before the subcommittee a, a, a month ago or so ago or three or four weeks ago and also before the MAPS 3 committee which is goes into great detail on each of the projects and each of the requests and where we're at financially and such. And we'd be happy to go through that today although I thought we would start with a summary presentation on this uh, Mike Mize is here to, to go over a summary presentation on this. Well, we thought we'd start there, and then if we need to go back into some more detail, we, we we're prepared to do that and can do that. Uh, Councilman Greenwell is asked, was the one last week that asked that this be continued. Uh, Mr. Greenwell has contacted my office and, and said that he is okay going forward with it at this time. That being said, Mike Mize is here to go a little bit over the summary of where we are to, today, because we just want to make sure that everybody's clear of where we're at, where we're at in the status of the funds on MAPS 3. Thank you. Mayor, council members, manager Couch. Um, this is <clears throat> going to be a fairly brief presentation today. Um, really, the only slide that I have is the slide that you see before you now, which gives an overview of the uh, remaining available excess collections. That's a number that's been determined by Craig Freeman and his office. Um, the, the uh, projected collections uh, balance right now is, is just over 29 million. We anticipate that there will be 22 million available from uh, convention center funds due to the very favorable bid that we received on that project. I need to note also that there's an $11 million project contingency for the convention center, which is not included in that $22 million. So, the normal project contingency is still available for the convention center um, aside from the 22 million that we show on the screen. So the total projected available funds is about 51 million. <clears throat> in the line items and the bullet points below that show the requests that have been made by the individual subcommittees. Um, as you can see, that totals almost $61 million which means if we were to try to fund all of those projects, we would have a shortfall of just about $10 million. So I'd be happy to an try to answer any questions. That's Mayor. If I could add a couple of mm -hmm. points. The, the projected collections isn't just projected collections. That's also interest that's been earned over, over the life of the project. So that's why that number that's adds to that number or makes that number to the level that it is. And of the requests down below, those are all asks that have been uncalled. There's, these, these, are, these are really everything that, that they've asked. And I just want to point out one of these because I think it's important. When you look at the trails and sidewalks, I think we've done some really, really good things with the trails and sidewalks. And we can, there's always more to do on that. But when you take a look at that $13 million number, please remember that we have millions of dollars that are set aside 
in the Better Street, Safer City program, and we have millions of dollars that are also there in the GEO uh, bond program. So it's not like we're not doing some significant things in that, in that area already and have additional funding that can be used in that area. So that's just one thing, one point, just, just one point of, of, of the issues that are out there. That actually was the point I was going to make, that this list of requests at $61 million is everything you could possibly ever think of that you might want that hasn't been completely vetted. So it does include an additional senior wellness center, and we haven't even yet broken ground on two and three, and so... Three and four. Three, I'm sorry, three and four. Um, <clears throat> and so there are some things in here that might not be realized or might not need to be realized until sometime in the future. So that $9 million, $10 million shortfall is probably um, a little hard to get our arms around to. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that's really there. So. What, can you talk about the fairgrounds request? I mean, this is the, the only entity that has a, a, built, a dedicated revenue stream that has bonding capacity. Um, so what, what, is, what is their $7 million? Or David has a list. I have this list. Okay. <laughs> it's broken into three different um, levels. And in the first level, there are two large LED screens that would be exterior on the building so that you could see it from the, the highway. There's some paving repairs. There's new um, power connections in the building. There's a, a full building sound system. What they have right now is just an emergency type sound system, and this would be a higher fidelity sound system. Um, the, the columns in the front entry area are um, uh, steel panel, if you will, and they're looking at maybe um, beefing that up and, and making it look nicer by doing rock on the cover and just making their, their entry better. Um, some wayfinding, some awnings, um, some LED lighting upgrades, just some things like that is, is in their first priority. Their second priority has got some equipment. Um, forklift to help them move the massive amount of chairs that we bought out there. Um, some golf carts to get around that building easier because it takes a long time to walk from one end to the next. So some things like that. And then in the third, um, third tier, there's some access control, just some miscellaneous stuff. It's only 262000 and, and all of that is for the new expo center? It is, except for the wayfinding. The wayfinding will probably be in the immediate area outside. All right. But they, they can't knock out some of that with their sizable allocation of the hotel motel tax? You know, there, there's choices to be made. They, 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 have, uh, they, they, they do have, obviously, a hotel motel tax screen that they've been used to do improvements out there, so you're not wrong on that. They have some other desires. I know, I think, you know, that, that they have desires to, to replace the, the arena out there, which is in bad shape, and so if you use it for that, you're going to have less of that money that's available for for the arena in the future. So it's where, where are they on their revenue, their uh, bonding capacity? I mean, are they maxed out? Or no, they... they're not, they are not maxed out. Okay. How, how much capacity do they have? I mean, ballpark or? Well, I hate giving, giving that. I don't, I, I just, I'm, I'm not, not sure if uh, Craig Freeman or Kenny Sudel might be in the back room. Okay, it doesn't. I'd, I'd be happy to back you yeah, with you on that. Yeah, never. Great. <laughs> You know, I had the privilege of serving on the sports oversight facility when we, some time ago, when we built the practice center, and, and we were not in this enviable position of having excess money and had to do a tremendous amount of value engineering on that project. And it sure is nice to be in a place where we can look at adding additional amenities, and in my opinion, most particularly things that will enhance revenue opportunities for these projects to help everybody get on financial footing because they don't have individual revenue streams the way some do. Talking to Councilman Greenwell, his concern was making sure that we, we this is not viewed as a first come, first serve scenario, that we have priorities onto this. And I think he became more comfortable when he realized that that isn't how this was done and that, that there is some seasonality and, and some reasons to do this because of, of getting some things done uh, over the winter with the, with the boathouse. What about, I mean, do we, we have no, I mean, there's no legal 
is there's no legal obligation to spend this on these necessarily these uh, seven, six projects, two, four, six. I mean, if this city has other capital needs, you could spend a portion on anything, correct? It would be a, you would have to change the, the MAPS 3 resolution of intent to do that. But it's a resolution, it could be done. Right. I think there would be a question, a bigger question, whether we're, we're changing the, the, the philosophy and the spirit of which those monies were intended. But that's a policy issue for council. So the, but the voters on the ballot voted for 1% for capital improvements. Correct. Yes, none, the question none, of the legality, yes, you're correct. You could none, none, none of these <laughs> items were on the ballot. Correct. That's correct. It's just that the, the council had a, a resolution that said this is what we're going to, this is what we're going to spend the monies on. Correct. Now, right, I mean, that, that ballot item was backed up by a list of projects that we said we would complete. Which, which we have, right? Right. So now we're, now we're doing add-ons to things that we've completed with excess funds. Well, or things that were. Well, I think, I think every one of these is a little different answer to that question. You know, like I think Union Station being in the park is not being touched would be an incomplete park, you know. Um, the fairgrounds sounds a little shakier to me. Feels like we've completed the Bennett Center. Um, you look at something like the uh, senior wellness centers, we did promise four or five, so a fifth senior wellness center seems to meet some of our promises to the voters. So I think it's a different answer to every question here in terms of whether the project is truly complete to, the, to what was promised in 2009. But to your question about the legality, sure, you can spend it on any capital project in Oklahoma City, but I think if you go beyond the, the scope of what was promised in 2009 to something totally off that list, you do you do run into, I think, a, a moral issue with the voters, the, the compact that we made with them. Another example would be the Senior Wellness Center number one in my ward. And you know, by the end of last year, we were hoping to have 1,000 members. And today we have over 5,000 members. And so there's inadequate restrooms for females, inadequate showers for females, same for the males, inadequate parking. Uh, people are having to park over in the church and walk to the Wellness Center. And so I think we're carrying the intent of what the voters voted for uh, for example, on that project, to try to enhance it, that we have adequate parking and adequate restaurant, restrooms and, and bathrooms. Okay. Yes, Councilman McAtee. From time to time, uh, I receive questions, and I'd, I'd like an official answer. Uh, the question goes something like, we know we need money for our schools, and our teachers need more money for salaries. Why don't you direct, quote, this money, unquote, for those uses, how would you respond to that? Well, the response to that was, one, is that this is for capital dollars, and that was what was ordered on was capital dollars, and those are not capital dollars. So that's the first issue. The second issue is that they're one-time dollars. And even if you could do that, it may not be fiscally responsible to do that, because you could do it once, and then you've, you've just dug yourself a hole for future years. So we're kind of on a subset of the discussion that's related to the item on the agenda, which is the totality of the requests. And for that purpose, David and Mike are here. Is there anything else we want to discuss with them, or do we want to kind of focus back on the river item, which is what's actually in front of us? I guess the one question I would have is, what's the timeline for coming back to us on these other things? I'm going to be presenting a really a, a detailed timeline to the advisory board this week that shows all of these projects and their times um, because the, the discussion with the advisory board has been they want, most of them want a, a new wellness center. Some of them are maybe not in, in favor as much, but now's not the time because we still have two to build. So that might be pushed off to 2020, somewhere in, in that area. So this plan will, will spell all of that out so that you can make that decision of uh, whether there'll be a wellness center at the, what I feel like is the appropriate time. Okay, any other further questions for David and Mike on this topic of the, all the requests? Okay. Thank well, you. then let's, let's kind of see where we want to go on, on, the, uh, on the river item. We, it is, of course, it's on the consent docket, so it falls under everything else. There's already a motion on the table. But, all right. So any further discussion on this topic? 
All right, well then we'll move forward. We've got uh, all of the consent docket items now and uh, anything else that anybody wanted to pull out? All right, any further discussion on any consent docket items? All right, seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, that brings us to the concurrence docket. Page 11, item eight. Second. We've got a motion for items A through I. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to item nine on page 13, items requiring separate votes. Uh, item A was already deferred at the beginning uh, of this meeting, which brings us to item B, ordinance on final hearing. This was recommended for denial from the Planning Commission. This is. Oh, and Bob's going to, let me just read it real quick. PUD uh, 1687 uh, at 1000 East Memorial Road. And uh, Bob, you have something to say? Yes, the applicant called our office a few minutes ago and asked that this be deferred till November 20th. Okay. November 20th. All right. We would need a motion and a vote for that deferral. Hey, Kenny, I have a question. Um, the applicant is a client of my law firm. And so can I move to defer it or should I recuse myself? And uh, it'd be best to recuse yourself since they're a client of your I'll, firm. I'll recuse it this time. All right, we'll, we'll pause for a moment. I'll make the motion that we defer to this item to the November 20th meeting. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to uh, defer the item to November 20th. Any discussion on that? Cast your votes, passes unanimously. All right, we're now on item C, 9C. This is a public hearing at first in, in relation to a resolution adopting and confirming an assessment role for the next year for the Western Avenue Business Improvement District uh, under item 9C1. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak uh, under the public hearing portion? Seeing none, uh, I would entertain a motion on 9C2, the resolution. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9D, ordinance on final hearing, uh, adopting and ratifying the assessment role for previously mentioned Western Avenue Business Improvement District, et cetera. Um, I would accept a motion. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to 9E1. Um, and I, 9E and 9F are related. These are sometimes known as the Airbnb ordinances. Um, and I know that Councilman Stonecipher has some thoughts he wanted to share and perhaps even a motion. We've had several meetings to discuss the ordinance and trying to make changes to the ordinance that would satisfy several different groups. And uh, we are continuing to have those discussions. And so I have been asked to move to defer this to the November 20th agenda. Okay. And that would be for E and F. Okay. Can he do one motion for both? Okay. All right. We've got a motion uh, second. and a second to defer items E and F to November 20th. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to 9G, ordinance on final hearing um, relating to, uh, this is the uh, adult novelty ordinance. This is the uh, final meeting. We've had this on twice previously. Um, we have the option of going into executive session if need be. It appears that Eric Groves would like to address the council on it. And yes. I think this would be the time for that. Good morning, Mayor, members of the council. I'm joined today by Mark Henriksen and John Coyle, who represent enterprises similar to the one I represent. Um, I'm going to ask that this be continued uh, because we are missing Councilman Greenwell and Councilman Cooper. Um, I think I know how the votes are going to fall on this. And without those two members of the council, we may not have five votes to pass this. Hmm. Anybody disagrees with me, let me know. But uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think there's a majority support for this ordinance on the council. But the council members have to be here to vote. Okay. Well, you would need a motion and a second and then a successful vote for a deferral. So I'll enter. <laughs> Uh, 
two weeks. Okay. That'd be good. And I'll second it, and I, I have a question um, about okay. the wording. Okay. Do we need to vote first, or can I ask? Well, I mean, to be strictly... Ask it for <laughs> Ask it now? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a line in there that we're adding. It says, regardless of whether or not an establishment is an adult novelty shop, no adult novelties shall be displayed in any windows on the premises visible by the public. I think this idea is good. Um, but my question is about the word displayed. Does displayed just mean seen? Or does it actually have to be close to the window for it to be displayed? It'd be, it'd be in the window and you could see it. In other words. But what if it was 10 feet back and you still could see, and you still could see it from the window? We are amenable to a change in the language if the municipal councilor thinks it appropriate to make it clear that they cannot be seen. seen. Yeah. I, th I think the drafter of the ordinance intended that it not be seen and yeah. displayed, but uh, between now and 6 November, if, if it's permissible. I would be more comfortable with it if it said seen. Can we do that, Mr. Jordan? Yes, it could be a, a shall, be, shall, this, shall not be displayed in a manner visible to the public or something like that. Is your, James, is your concern that the, the windows are open and basically you can just see the entire yeah, store? you can see the entire store. Right. right. One particular one. Uh -huh. Yes. That, that can be. We'll, we'll do an amendment. Yeah. Okay. Yes, to accomplish that and you can adopt that at final hearing. Okay, thanks. I do, but we will still hear it on 6 November. Yes. I mean, we don't have to go. Okay, great. Yeah. Yes. Right, session. if that passes, but yes. Okay, um, we're actually on the motion to defer. We had a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes uh, one, two, three, four, five, six to one. So the motion uh, carries and the uh, item will be deferred Thank to you. November 6th. Thank you, 6th. we'll see you on the 6th. Okay, that brings us to 9H, public hearing regarding ordinance relating to vehicles for hire and other transportation services. This is the second of three um, times this item will appear on our agenda. This relates to streetcar. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak under the public hearing portion? Seeing none, we'll move on to item 9I. This is the first of three times this item will appear on the agenda. Uh, this is the uh, ordinance to be introduced, set for public hearing November 6th, final hearing November 20th, relating to alcohol, beverages, and low point beer, et cetera. And I believe Chief City is here to brief us on this. Thank you, Council. Uh, I think as everybody knows, as of October 1st, the state ta statutes on uh, alcohol have changed. The st statutes changed October 1st and went into effect then. The ordinance, and I'll, uh, Orville Jones did a lot of work on this, did a great job, did a lot of work trying to adapt it to what the new state statutes now are going to say. And most of this is basically just incorporating the requirements and, and regulations that you'll find in this new state statute so that the city can enforce those laws also. Uh, and, and, and hold the licensee, uh, obviously, uh, require the licensee to adhere to those re regulations. So basically, the, some of the main highlights in those regulations, it's, it's first important to note that there is no more beer. I mean, there is beer, but it, beer is beer, wine is wine, alcohol. It's all the same because it's all, there's no more 3.2 beer. There's no low point beer addressed in our ordinance or in state statute anymore. It's all, it's all over that. It doesn't exist anymore. So. The state now, the state now, ABLE Commission actually does all the licensing. They license everything. Uh, where, we, where we come into play is where they have to present, before approval, present that license, that, that, that a license or that, um, you know, the, the applicant making the license to the city and that we'll look at it to make sure that it complies with all code, zoning, uh, code requirements, zoning requirements, no history of the, 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 licensee, the licensee of background, that kind of stuff, of felonies, past violations. We get to look at that and then we can object to that before they issue the license. So that we have some inputs because we do not issue the license, it's all state. The requirements in the new law allow us to, to hold the licensee accountable to all those regulations. And if there are violations, enough violations that, that our ordinance allows us to appeal just like the state law allows us to appeal to the ABLE Commission 
for a revocation. Uh, and they can revoke that license based on our appeal if we've gone out and we've found a num numerous violations and they're continuous. Uh, this, also, this also allows for the city, once they have the license, if there are a number of violations and they already have the license, then we can appeal to the ABLE Commission to revoke that license based on numerous violations. It also allows our, our, the city legal staff, based on, on the, the police chief's request, to appeal any decision that we disagree with on the ABLE Commission to district court. The state law allows that. Our ordinance incorporates that so that we can do that. Uh, which, which can be important because if we find enough violations they've already given a license to, then we need the ability to appeal those types of things. Um, those, are, those are some of the basic highlights. There's, there's things in there about closing times and things like that, new closing times for package stores versus clubs and things like that. Package stores, they can basically, the language in there, and it's also in our ordinance, the state statute and ordinance, package stores can, can sell from, from like, I think it's from 6 a.m. to to midnight. Where a club, it's a club. It's from like 8 a.m. till 2 o'clock. They have to close completely. Close their club at 2 o'clock. They can't even be open. They have to stop serving and shut down their club so that we don't have people that are inebriated and they can lock their doors and start selling. So it's a. I think it's a good rule that the state put in their language, and we've we've adopted that to help us enforce it. So those are some of the highlights. If there's any questions, I'll be glad to add, answer those. Any questions for Chief City? Okay. Well, thank you, Chief. Um, we do need to have a motion to introduce the ordinance for consideration. So move the item. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to. 9J, this is uh, also uh, making its first appearance of three on our agenda. Ordinance to be introduced, set for public hearing November 6th, final hearing November 20th, relating to businesses and general schedule of fees, et cetera. And I believe Eric Winger, our public works director, is here to make a brief presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're, we're happy to present to you today an update to our pre-qualification review ordinance. Um, this is an ordinance that was actually originally and last updated in 1997, so it's been some time, and there are just some things that have changed since. One of those would be the fees. Some of those would also be some of the pre-qualification categories. So to give you a little bit of a brief background, the reason for the creation of the pre-qualification ordinance was to assure that we had contractors working predominantly on public work that had gone under some type of review and, and compliance um, process um, before they actually were able to perform that work. And so we do contract with a number of contractors, not just on public projects, but there's a lot of private contractors too that do work in the public right away. Um, so there's a number of categories that were created in 1997. They, uh, they generally encompass anything that is road, bridge, sidewalk, water, and sewer. There's some other categories as well, but as you think about public work, this is not something that replaces the building code or the building code inspections. It's strictly for a lot of the public utility work. Um, but since that time, um, the board, um, which um, serves, meets once a month. Um, we review applications. There's an annual renewal process for contractors that's been well um, organized. Um, we have all the contractors that are participating um, that do those annual reviews. Um, it includes both in-city, out-of-city, and out-of-state contractors. Um, but with that, we've got a number of changes that we need to present um, to you today. So this is the introduction of that ordinance. Um, one of the biggest changes is, is that we're ready to add some additional categories. The categories are actually included in the ordinance now, so the only way to change those is to do ordinance revisions. What this update will do is actually move those categories to be a process of the actual board that meets monthly. So if you look at the document that was attached to your council item, you're going to see that those categories and the specific classifications have been stricken um, with the idea that there is a new document that creates those categories that's then managed by the board. So if we have a change, the board can then review and make those changes without having to actually update the ordinance. Um, we're also looking um, to add some new categories. We're also looking to combine the licensing and the application process to make that one process. You also see that there are updates for the fees. And so the fees also have not been updated for 
many years, and those costs for the reviews and the cost to actually do that work um, have increased. Um, we've also included an, an annual increase that's based on the CPI index. This would be similar to what Public Works has done on some other fee proposals, whether it is fees in lieu of, um, the drainage utility, and some of those others that are part of, of city renewals. Um, with that, we've had a lot of, of interaction with uh, several city departments, so a lot of my appreciation goes out to the Municipal Counselor's Office, to Craig Keith, to Haley Rawson, to some of our own Public Works staff. They spent about a year um, preparing this ordinance for your consideration today. Um, the Pre-Qualification Review Board met this month and recommended that the Council receive it today as an introduction. Obviously, there will be two additional public hearings in about two weeks, then a final hearing in about a month. Um, and I think with that, I can answer any questions you might have about pre-qualification for Oklahoma City. I just have one question. The, uh, how did you arrive at the rate increases on those? Because it looked like, basically it looked like all of them doubled. So one of the things is that the licensing fee, which used to be a separate fee, is now combined with the application fee. So both are being now taken at the same time. What you would find previously is with there was an application fee for pre-qualification. When the contractor was approved, they then went to development services and then paid a companion licensing fee. Both those fees are now one fee, both received at the time of the pre-qualification application. It's really to streamline that process. It also helps us have the same anniversary date. So we were finding in previous years that the license might not be renewed at the same time of pre-qualification. And it caused some, some challenges when we were actually trying to make sure that we were managing work and having both pre-qualified contractors that were also licensed to do work in the city. That's probably the biggest increase. One of the things you'll see is that the out-of-state um, fee has dramatically increased. Something we used to provide with Public Works and the staff that oversee the pre-qualification is actually on-site visits. With the need for possible out-of-state travel, one of the reasons that the out-of-state fee is higher than the in-state fee is to provide for those travel expenses is we look to actually ramp up making sure that those applicants are actually who they say they are, that they're actually operating the business that they've applied for before we approve them. Thanks. Any other questions for Eric? Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second to introduce the ordinance for consideration. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Eric. That brings us to 9K. This is also the first of three meetings. Uh, this will appear on the agenda. This is um, amendments to the downtown MAPS Economic Development Project Plan. It supports the development around the site of the AICCM. This was discussed a little bit at our last meeting. Uh, of course, this schedules a public hearing November 6th, the final hearing November 20th. Um, our staff, we have a presentation on this? We do not. We had a okay. presentation two weeks ago. Okay. I do want to point out that at that meeting, we, we did call for the TIF Review Committee to, to convene. They did convene, and uh, last week met and reviewed it. And uh, we had a new member this time that's not been in a TIF Review Committee, and that was the Crooked Oak Schools. Okay. And so they participated, and uh, it was voted on unanimously at that point in time. And so, again, this is the, the first of the, of the three meetings that we will have. Uh, to create, actually create the TIF. I do want to point out that it does have a, a sales tax provision part of it, but that will be reviewed on a project by project uh, need. And so that either you will have future, even after it's created, you will have future opportunities to decide whether or not to participate in the sales tax portion. Okay, any um, questions on that item? I would entertain a motion. We need to uh, approve its introduction. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, that brings us to 9L. These are uh, dilapidated structures. Uh, uh, item L1 is a public hearing regarding the uh, five dilapidated structures on today's agenda. Is there anyone here who would look, wishes to speak? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for item 9L2, a resolution declaring that the structures are dilapidated. Move the item. Second. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we have item 9M1. This is a public hearing regarding the unsecured structures listed on the agenda, except for the four that were stricken at the beginning of the meeting. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak on these items? 
Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for 9M2, the resolution to declaring the structures are unsecured. Move the resolution. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9N1, this is a public hearing regarding the abandoned buildings listed on the agenda, except for the three that were stricken at the beginning of the meeting. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for 9N2, the resolution declaring that the buildings are abandoned. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. This brings us to 901. Uh, this is a public hearing on 902, which is a resolution approving an allocation of Northeast Renaissance Project uh, Increment District Number 9 funds for Northeast 23rd and Coltrane Multifamily Project, 2.5 million in Ward 7. There was a bit of a discussion and presentation on this at the last meeting. Um, maybe Councilman Cooper, you want if to kind of lead no, this? Yeah, if there's no uh, discussion, I move for adoption. Okay. Is there anyone here, I, since there is a public hearing, I always like to say the magic words. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak? Okay, we've got a motion. Second. And a second. Uh, is there any further discussion? Councilman Shady, I see you reaching for your button. Oh, you're voting. Okay, got it. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, one. Well, but this was just, this is just the public hearing. No, that was, we just approved the allocation. Oh. I can, we can call for a revote. Can we call for a <laughs> Absolutely. Um, a motion and a second would be in order for a revote. Okay. Second. Second. All right. Very good. Well, let's do a revote on the, uh, on ni item 902. And sorry if I was unclear. This is the resolution approving an allocation of $2.5 million in TIF number nine. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. Now we'll vote again. Okay. Uh, you probably want to go red. Right? <laughs> six, six to two. All right. Passes six to two. Okay. That brings us to item 9P1 uh, is a public hearing regarding 9P2, which is a resolution amending the June 13th, 2017 City Council resolution approving certain fire listed projects. Um, obviously, I think we heard a little bit about this at the last meeting. This has to do with salaries and with the contract amendments and the sales tax that passed through where we ended up. This is, we pay for a certain number of, of uniform positions out of the sales tax, and this is to adjust that for the salary adjustments. Okay. So this is the second public hearing under item 9P1. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for 9P2, the resolution. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9Q, MAPS 3 Streetcar Stop Naming Agreement with Campbell Art Park, LLC. Uh, revenue of $31,393.92. Mr. Couch, do you want to explain this? Uh, David, do you want to take this one? We have an opportunity to, to uh, have sponsorships for some of the uh, streetcar stops. This is one of those. <clears throat> right, and this is a... a the, the money that Campbell Art Park is paying back to us to, to do some changes to the stop name. And, and as the streetcar approaches the stops, you'll hear it say you're now approaching Campbell Art Park. And um, that, that was the cost to do some of those changes to get them uh, what they wanted because we'd already done a lot of the work. We've got a motion and a second. And it will Any be called Art Park. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any discussion? So, um, can this be a source of revenue for other streetcar stops? David, did no, you hear the question? Right. Embark is working on a plan for sponsoring and doing advertising at the various stops. This was really a cost associated with those recordings and the graphics that were already up there and as they wanted to change them. But yeah, there are opportunities for Embark to, to have some revenue at the stops and also in the car. Yeah. Okay, any further questions or discussion? Uh, we have a motion, right? Yes. We have a motion and a second. Seeing no further discussion, cast your votes, passes unanimously. Item 9R, resolution adopting a corrected management, administrative and technical support classification list, et cetera. 
at last at the last meeting two weeks ago we adopted several plans one for the AFSCME, one for this one one for the the, the uh, auditors and and, and uh, municipal council's office in the specific one for management administration technical support classifications some classifications were left out so this is just to correct that i'd move the item second. okay we've got a motion and a second any uh, further discussion seeing none cast your votes passes unanimously Item 9S1, resolution approving the request for salary continuation for Corporal Timothy Chisholm. Do we need an executive session, Kenny, that you know of? We do not. I'll entertain a motion. Move the item second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9T1, resolution approving the request for salary continuation for Major William Fulton. Do we need an executive session, Kenny? I'd entertain a motion. Move the item. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9U1, resolution authorizing Richard C. Smith and Sherry Katz, assistant municipal counselors, to represent and defend city employee William J. City in the case of uh, Pigeon v. Sweeney. Uh, do we need an executive session that you know of, Kenny? No. Okay. Any? Uh, got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9V, enter into executive session to discuss collective bargaining negotiations for the existing fiscal year with the FOP and the firefighters. Uh, we would need a motion to go into executive session. Got a motion and a second. Any uh, further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll handle that at the, uh, after the other business. 9W1, claims recommended for denial. Uh, we've got A through G. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak? I would entertain a motion. Chairman. Got a motion and a second. I don't believe we need executive session, so we'll proceed. If uh, any further discussion, seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to 10A1, claims recommended for approval. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak? Seeing none, I don't believe we need executive session. I would entertain a motion. Got a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And in Holt mayoral term record time, we are now at item 11. <laughs> Just in case anyone's keeping track. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Mayor, you should have said that after items from council. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, now they're gonna now they're gonna milk it. All right, item item eleven, items from council. We'll start down here, Councilman Griner. I just have one comment. I got to address certain things before my term is over. But going back to, is, is it all spaced out? Is it kind of? A, is it? Do we have it yeah, all? Yeah, I got to. I got certain things. I got to get covered. <laughs> so. But on so you you introduced your maps for seeking public mm -hmm. comment for the public, which I appreciate. The the comments today um, that we have uh, a moral obligation to spend the fund to honor our resolution and do these seven eight projects that were outlined to the voters uh, that it's the spirit that we that that's the policy of the council that we can't. Uh, we can only use it for those things. To me, it's, it's always uh, bothered me that, that it really constitutes log rolling. That that, that, that if, you're, if you're saying that the policy is that we can only spend it on these seven or eight uh, projects, then basically you're giving what the Supreme Court has called an unpalatable choice to the voter where they may have to vote for one thing they don't like in order to get the thing that they do like. And it's an all or nothing, unpalatable, all or nothing choice. And as we get ready for MAPS 4 and we, we, we roll this out, I just ask that the council think about that. I mean, I won't be here, but I'd ask that the council think about that. I mean, people have talked about a stadium. Are you going to make the voters vote for a stadium that they don't want because they get I don't know, a senior wellness center that they do want. I mean, it's just, when we do our, our general obligation bonds, we have like 13 different votes. We let people vote separately on 13, 14 different things. Why not let the voters vote on everything separately and tell us what they do want and what they don't want? But I think that when you, you, know, when you do an 
even if it's a resolution and it's not actually on the ballot, you're basically saying, you know, tax yourself for these seven or eight projects or none of the seven or eight. I mean, it's an all or nothing. And that's just, it's always bothered me for the last eight, for many, many years, and it'll, it'll bother me in the next year. So I just want to give voice to that. And I'm, not, I'm certainly not the only one that, that thinks that. There have been cases that, you know, Supreme Court has ruled this over and over. The legislature has done like bonds, where they'll have three different sources for the bonds, and the Supreme Court has said, no, just because it's bonds, you can't then separate it into three different things. And I think the same thing applies here. Just because you're saying it's for capital projects, you can't then divide it into seven or eight completely different projects and then say, well, it's just for capital, so it's one subject. The bottom line is it's never really been tested in the Supreme Court, and so I, I don't know that anybody knows the, the answer definitively, but it, there's enough there that, that it's certainly worthy of, of thinking about. Are, are we putting the voter, are we making the voter have an unpalatable all or nothing choice? Thanks. Councilman McAtee? Councilman Stone? Just uh, want us to be mindful of the fact that this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and also Domestic Abuse Month. And so I'll wear yellow. I'm in a thinking honor of that. Okay. Just briefly, I wanted to thank the council today for approving the park that's going to be built in Ward 8. Um, that's been about two years in the works, and uh, I'd particularly like to thank uh, the Park Commission and Alan Payne, the chair. I'd like to thank Tim Smith and his group that we've worked on this for a long, long time. I'd like to thank Doug Cupper, uh, the Director of Parks, and I'd really like to thank uh, Dan Brummett, who helped draft the agreements that were executed. Um, it's been a lot of work, but it's been a lot of fun work. Thank you. Okay. That brings us to item 12, City Manager Reports, and I think we're actually going to do some of these today. In interest of, of time, over in time, <laughs> as we had two o'clock meetings, we did cut some reports over the last few weeks. One of the most important ones is the capital improvement plan that, that uh, we did not hear and need to hear. And so we're going to start with that one today. And with that, Doug Dollar is here to kick off the capital improvement plan presentation. All right, several weeks ago, we introduced this five-year CIP plan. It totaled $3.1 billion. Uh, we introduced that plan. It's been to the Planning Commission as well. They're reviewing that, and their recommendation is coming back to the Council. Uh, normally, we have several departments uh, present their plans. That's what we're going to be doing some of that today. Uh, and then at the next meeting, we'll have the plan for your adoption as well as the recommendation from the Planning Commission. And so uh, to start off today, we have the Parks Department, uh, followed by Utilities and Public Works. Seems like the double D show, Doug and Doug. Uh, Doug Cupper, Director of Parks and Recreation for the record. Uh, you will find our capital, um, five-year capital plan on page 72 in the, in the uh, document. Uh, I do want to say that, that City Manager Couch uh, would not allow me to ask for the whole $3.3 .3 billion. So, so we, we tried to get it down to the... <laughs> and that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> something more manageable. Uh, we used the, the Parks Master Plan. The Park Master Plan was actually created uh, in 2013 and 14. It was adopted by the City Council in, in April of 2014. And it's kind of our, uh, our uh, for lack of a better term, a Bible that we try to uh, manage all of our activities in, in conjunction with. It's actually part of Plan OKC as well. I do want to state there are six manifestations that, that the uh, um, stakeholders and the citizens requested. They want us to maintain and improve the physical assets of existing parks. They want us to develop facilities and programs in existing parks to meet community needs. They wanted us to improve access to existing parks, promote and increase awareness of the value and economic impact of parks, develop new parks and facilities, and establish agreements and standards to, uh, for private parks and, and school parks. I, I do want to point out that we have worked on all of these, but the, the last one, establish agreements and standards for private parks, that, that uh, bows to the existence of our impact fees and how we are managing those and, 
in helping developers create opportunities within their subdivisions uh, in creating a new green space, open space, and, and we are working with them, and it's been a good partnership thus far. We are requesting over the next five years $91.8 million. Um, it's broken down by year there. Uh, 2019 and 2020 is, is one of our larger uh, ask years. And as we go to the next slide, you can see how it's kind of broken down. Park improvements, uh, 33.2. Obviously, I don't need to read them. You can, you can see for yourself what we're asking for. The big thing is, is, is the citizens want us to maintain what we have, and we need to reinvest in those existing parks that we have, the 164 parks that, that we manage for the citizens of, of Oklahoma City. Uh, we have uh, almost 100 miles of paved trails now, and as City Manager Couch mentioned earlier, we've got funding in the 2017 GO for trails. We also have in the uh, neighborhood and community enhancement uh, funds. We have funds there. Uh, those uh, primarily are used to, uh, in a lot of cases to build new parks. We need to make sure that we have funds available to maintain what we have going forward. Um, some of that's being handled by the enhancement tax. We're, we're right now uh, under construction for revitalizing the Burke Cooper Trail up in, up in Lake Hefner. Uh, it's being resurfaced and, and uh, we're anxious to get all of our trails rehabilitated. Projects by type, uh, you can see it's broken down. Uh, the majority of the funding there is uh, park improvements to the existing parks. As I said, currently we are at 164 parks. If we count Scissor Tail uh, as one of our newest assets, we will be at 165 uh, once the uh, the deed and titles to the lands that you approve the purchase of and the donation of today will be at 165 parks. We want to make sure that we can take care of those. Uh, all told, though, if, if you talk, if we talk turkey as we get close to the Thanksgiving, we manage 26,000 acres of recreational lands. 22,000 acres is actually underwater or, or surface areas of the water utilities lakes. We manage the boating, the recreational activities on their behalf on those bodies of water. So we want to make sure that we are providing for everybody's uh, recreational needs. So we, when we report our acreage to Trust for Public Land or the National Recreation Park Association, we put that caveat in there that we do manage 26,000 acres, 22,000 acres, surface acres of water, and then 5,000 acres of park lands. Projects by funding source, again, uh, the majority of our funding for the capital improvements that we're talking about today comes from GEO bonds, 91%. Uh, we get uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1% for, from the CIP program, and then uh, we have 8% that's unfunded. Uh, obviously, we use the unfunded uh, just like Public Works does for those things that we don't anticipate, overruns on cost of some of the geo projects, we have to uh, get some more money into those activities. Uh, if something fails that we did not anticipate in the, in the creation of the 2017 or even the 2007, we need to be able to step up and take care of those, those types of activities. Projects by locations, uh, we've, we've pretty well spread them out throughout the city. Um, we've identified needs as far south as, as uh, um, well, I'm drawing a blank. Which one? South Lakes, excuse me. And, and as far north as, as uh, um, Lake Hefner. Some of the project improvements that are on the drawing board right now, and we should be under construction fairly soon, is the, the Manuel Perez Park Improvements. Uh, most of you will remember that Manuel Perez was a Medal of Honor recipient from World War II. Uh, he, uh, we used to recognize his, his valor on the north side of the river. Um, we decided that it, it wasn't that imposing of a, of a place to recognize the valor of somebody that lost their life uh, uh, in, in the guarding of our constitution, our way of life. So we moved it south of the river with the help of, of uh, Councilmember White and Councilmember Meg Salyer. Um, 
we met for a year with the neighbors on the south side of the river to talk about what kind of park they thought Manuel Perez should be. Our, our design consultants have uh, recognized that emphasis, and this is a rendering of what the, uh, the old Rose Circle area in Manuel Perez Park might look like uh, after construction. The uh, colored pavement in the center represents the, uh, the, the blue, and, uh, blue field with the white stars of, of the actual Medal of Honor ribbon and, and that sort of thing. We're expanding it. We won't just recognize Manuel Perez at this park. Uh, we're anticipating recognizing the 30 recipients of the Medal of Honor here in the state of Oklahoma at this location. Uh, McKinney, McKinley Park uh, got a facelift uh, again. We worked with the neighborhood in that area to come up with their ideas of what was needed at McKinley Park. Construction is done, uh, the shelter is there, the new playground expansion is there. Uh, we even put in a, a little platform area so that the neighborhood could have actual performances in the park. And they have worked with our, our partner group that operates the McKinley Building to actually put a mural, again, enhancing McKinley Park. Uh, Route 66 Park is one of those features that we're, uh, we're proud of all our projects, but this one will give us an opportunity to uh, bring uh, those people that are physically challenged in our community out to learn the American pastime of baseball. Uh, the, the baseball field that you see depicted in here will the whole infield and outfield is rubberized safety surfacing, like we are putting under our playgrounds, so that a child in a wheelchair running the bases, if catastrophically they, have, it, it, they fall, or a kid on crutches that bats the ball and is running first base, if they do take a tumble or a spill, it's resilient, they they'll bounce off it. And, and uh, uh, we're, we're already uh, working with the uh, uh, wounded warriors and, and some of the uh, veterans groups to try to bring baseball back to those, those military people that, that uh, might have lost a limb or, or are now somewhat handicapped or in some form or measure handicapped. Again, giving them the opportunity to, to enjoy the American pastime. Uh, we have two skate uh, elements being, uh, that are under construction. One is at uh, Shields Park on the south side. It's a, it's a small skate element where our recreation staff are lining up instructors and we'll be able to teach safe skateboarding techniques and activities, inline skating, that sort of thing, uh, at one of our recreation centers. Uh, we are adding a larger element to Stars and Stripes Park uh, on the far north side of town. Um, I, again, believe it or not, uh, skateboarding is still one of the fastest growing sports. It's, it's Close second, uh, unusually, is pickleball. So, so uh, we got different ends of the spectrums uh, uh, being requested of us. And, and uh, uh, Councilmember Cooper and Mayor Halt uh, have just recently got a request for a skate park up in the northeast side of town. Uh, so we're looking at, at the possibility of that in the near future. Uh, indoor facilities, our Melrose Gym got a facelift, uh, brand new. Uh, um, synthetic flooring for our basketball volleyball program out at, out at Melrose. Um, staff is getting real creative and making sure that we are branding our facilities so when we're uh, having sports activities in our facilities, people are taking selfies or photographs of their family members playing sports. We're getting the names of our parks inv involved in it as well. And of course, uh, this is uh, Improvements to a linear park, uh, again, up in the northeast end of town, up in Woodland Park. Uh, some of the seating areas, some of the uh, resting plazas. Uh, again, uh, a large scale uh, porch swing was installed as part of those uh, trail improvements. Some of the ones that are on the drawing board and, and contracts have just been let is the Deep Fork uh, trail system. Uh, again, this is one of those missing segments to link different loops together so that uh, in, in a matter of years you'll be able to circumnavigate um, by bicycle the, the complete city. This is one of those real hardcore ones. And then uh, again, uh, one of the park improvements going towards our health and wellness activities is, is the fitness courts. We have uh, 
We have four under construction right now across the city. They'll be at Woodson, uh, Wiley Post, Douglas Park, and um, Stars and Stripes Park. But we also have a, a donor that, that stepped up in the Boathouse District. So uh, one in Regatta Park is under construction as well. So, so by the end of November, we will have five of these state-of-the-art uh, free fitness areas in our parks. Our goal is to get to 10. Uh, we're working with the National Fitness Campaign out of San Francisco for a grand uh, unveiling of us being their premier city for uh, their National Fitness Campaign in spring of, of 2019. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Doug? Thank you all. Thank you, Mayor and Council. We're going to present the Public Works CIP for you and bring that up on screen here in just one minute. Um, I think as we presented in the past, um, as we look at Public Works, we begin on page 94. So if you have your booklet with you today, 94 is where we're starting. So what we do, um, I don't think this is probably going to be news for you, but if we've got those that are maybe watching this meeting, it's just a, it's a kind of a friendly reminder. A lot of the things that we look at from Public Works are the items you see on the screen, street widening, resurfacing, bridges, drainage, facilities, traffic, and also street enhancements. Um, the department is about 400 employees, um, and then we, of course, have broken into several divisions that support um, making these types of things happen all across the, the city. We use this infographic from time to time um, in a lot of our presentations just to kind of show the depth of, of all the things that we do. Um, I think most already know, and, and it's not uncommon for us to explore the 620 square miles of Oklahoma City, but that includes over 3,500 miles of road. There's actually 8,000 lane miles, but 3,500 linear miles. We have over 50 miles of drainage channel, over 50,000 traffic control signs. 12,000 signals that are in over 750 signalized intersections. And so as we get ready to present the CIP, this is, this is the area that we're covering for Oklahoma City. We align our CIP with the council priorities, um, and there's actually three of them. Um, we look to develop a transportation system that works for all residents. Two of those priorities are the percent of residents satisfied with the condition of city streets, and also assisting in the number of miles of trail and sidewalk constructed. The second council priority that we focus on is the uphold of high standards for all city services. And again, we look at the percentage of residents satisfied with the quality of city services and also the number of service requests that we respond to timely that are coming to the action center. And then the last one is maintaining a strong financial management system. Again, as we look at bond ratings, the deployment of the bond program, and now the Better Street Safer City sales tax, and these are all things that we are keen to as we move forward with project planning I'm in public works. Better Street Safer City is, is obviously our largest um, single capital program that's going to make up the majority of, of our CIP presentation today. Um, it includes the 2017 general obligation bond at $967 million, but it also has the companion tax, uh, the 27-month $240 million program, again, focused on streets, sidewalks, trails, and streetscapes are really the largest pieces of those programs as we move forward. So on the 2017 general obligation bond, nearly 500 million um, towards streets and sidewalks, and about 170 million um, in the sales tax as we move forward. When we break our plan down by year, um, this will show you as we go from 2019 to 2023, um, we are going to average over the next few short years about a $200 million program. Um, that's with the combined tax that was passed last year as well. So when we look at fiscal year 19, um, it's 206 million. 2020 is 218 million. In 2021, when the sales tax no longer is being collected, we actually will start to decline to 182 million. And in 2022 and 2023, we still are in excess of 100 million, but those numbers then are fully supported back onto the bond program. And this is what that project works by type. So as I've mentioned, Streets is our largest, um, with over 60% of our CIP focused on streets, but we do also support these other areas that you see on this graph. Um, we've got the traffic at almost 18 million, bridges at 23, drainage, libraries, facilities. Um, I'll show you a few facility projects that are part of our CIP um, that are non-MAPS projects. Um, and then, of course, we also support police, fire, and parks. The total CIP, $821 million. 
This is by funding source, and so you'll see on the left-hand side, we've actually, the predominant funding source is the bond. We still have some 2007 also remaining. Um, so if you combine those totals, it's about 73%, um, which is total bond dollars, but we also are supported by the drainage utility, the Better Street Safer City Sales Tax, which you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen, and then also the Public Property Authority at the bottom. We've, we stacked this graph to show that increase that I've mentioned over the next two to three years with the sales tax. And so at the bottom, you have the bond totals. On the top, in the different color, shade of purple, we have the sales tax. And again, you'll see that summary, 200 million for the next two years, then starting to slightly decline to where we then go back into the nearly $100 million annual program that's supported by the bond. So we're very busy right now. Um, obviously, with the implementation of projects citywide, um, I will show you some of the projects here on a map, and the mapping is also available online. So one of the things we continue to reinforce for those that are wanting to know more about the Better Street, Safer City, is to go to OKC.gov, um, Better, Safer, and look at those projects. You can zoom into a map. Um, the mayor has also published a list that shows a listing of those projects, if that's more convenient. But again, those projects are active, and, and they're all online for those to view. This is that map. It's not interactive today for our presentation purposes, but as we look at this, the bond issue and we look at the tax projects that have already been approved, I mean, you're going to find that they range across the entire city. We're in all wards, we're in all areas, and work is underway. Now, the work can't all be completed in one year, and that's why we're presenting the five-year CIP today. But again, we're starting to see a lot of the, the work. Um, intersections in all wards. We're taking a lot of phone calls, some good, some bad, but obviously as we have some inconveniences, we are resurfacing um, about 500 miles of street um, as a part of Better Street, Safer City. This is some of the widening projects that are also included. Um, there are 18 um, projects in the bond issue that are widening. It's, it's much less than what we've experienced in the past, but this is Southwest 29th, Rockwell to MacArthur. Moving on to some of the additional projects that we see, this is Cassero Road, 29th to 59th. This is a joint project with the Oklahoma Trans uh, OTA. So as we work with the Turnpike, and, and this is one of our 2017 bond projects, we had a city contribution to help make the widening of Cerro Road a possibility. This is Turtle Lake. Um, as we look into residential resurfacing, um, the bond is not just our arterials and the sales tax is not just um, Arterial streets as well. We're in neighborhoods. This is Turtle Lake at Southeast 149th and Sooner. We're also at Northwest 36th and Walker. I'm starting to look at intersection improvements. And so as we enhance intersections with new capable um, handicapped crosswalks, um, the countdown timers, um, upgrading some of the, the paint and a lot of the safety surfacing that is there, um, these projects are also included. Moving to 10th and Martin Luther King, we have a lot of intersections that, that look just like this. They've not been updated in a while. Um, we do our best with the resources that we have, but as we go into an intersection with, with new funding, it's anticipated to modernize these again, and uh, I think you'll see some significant changes once we're able to complete this project at this location. 63rd and Drexel, there's a number of drainage projects. We continue to maintain a drainage um, list as residents call in most likely after a, a major rain event. Um, we do categorize and prioritize those into, into three levels. Um, we have a lot of street flooding that occurs in the city, which um, is our lowest priority. We have yard flooding, and then we have structural flooding, which is our highest. And so as we maintain that list of structural flooding complaints, we are prioritizing projects like Northwest 63rd and Drexel um, and others across the city to take care of those needs. This is another picture of the Drexel project that, that is also here. Again, as we look at bridge crossings, as we look at drainage facilities, there's drainage enhancements as a part of the CIP. I mentioned some of the facility projects, and so this is some of the non-MAPS work that's underway in the city. Uh, this was also discussed briefly on the agenda today. These are some of the improvements um, with the USA Softball Hall of Fame project. We've got several phases of work that are occurring currently, um, work proceeding through next year for completion. Um, in 2019-2020 with different parts of that facility. All of this is bond funded at this time and so work is proceeding as planned. Um, this is street widening projects and some of the after. So this is one of the after widening projects here on Western Avenue from 164th to 178th. These are some of the residential resurfacings after. Recalling that a lot of the residential streets, you know, they're 20 and 30 plus years old. They have not seen resurfacing. The street conditions aren't um, always um, 
terrible, but we find that those streets are in need where they're starting to show signs of age and stress and cracks. So able to go into these neighborhoods and actually put in the new streets, also work on, in a lot of cases, some of the sidewalk needs and making them more walkable as well. These are some of the street enhancements. Um, these are some of those new projects that we're going to start to see more of in the bond issue and also the better streets. This happens to be the Western Avenue, Northwest 43rd Street. Um, there was a street enhancement from 41st to 45th. Uh, we've recently completed additional work on Western Avenue from 18th to 23rd. Um, we're working very closely with planning on new streetscape projects citywide as well. So you can anticipate seeing many more of those types of projects like this that are not just a simple resurfacing, but again, as we talk about complete streets, um, streets like this one as well. These are some additional enhancements on May Avenue, 10th to Reno, and not all streets are the same when we look at streetscapes. Some call for complete streets, others call for enhanced walkability, others include um, new lighting um, and other features like landscaping. These are some of our drainage projects after Southwest 44th and May doing channel repairs. So a lot of cases we're upgrading those concrete line channels to make sure that they're efficient in, in maintaining those areas of the city. Ceron Road Bridge, and so we're also enhancing and updating these. It's hard to see in this photo, but we're using a lot of Gabion basket um, wall construction. That's the, the wall that you see to the lower right hand portion of this photo. There's a, a push um, for engineering. Not that all channels need to be concrete lined, but that a lot of natural materials are also being utilized in construction going forward. It helped minimize some of the environmental impacts, especially when we're handling a lot of those uh, large amounts of water, but then also in residential areas as well. Completed facility projects also include the municipal courts. I know we had a grand opening with this, but again, a non-MAPS project that was a part of our bond, one that Public Works assisted on. Everybody's had an opportunity to either visit municipal courts or in the last few years the new police headquarters. But again, those are projects that public works support. And with that, um, I can answer any questions that you might have. We continue to appreciate the council's support for the programs. Again, I would just reiterate a lot of the work is on the city's website at okc.gov. So if you have projects or get questions from from constituents that are in your individual wards, there's the ability to, to zoom into a ward or just into a neighborhood or actually just look at a project list and see all the different things that are happening across the city. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions for Eric? Okay. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. I think you got one more? We do. Chris Brown? It isn't Chris. <laughs> Maintenance here is. Chris, Chris is out of town. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here to present. Uh, my name is Nathan Madwald. I'm with the Utilities Department. I present the five year CIP for utilities. Never mind. I think it's working. Erica, sorry. Okay, I apologize. Um, utilities develop core business initiatives to align with the council priorities. Customer service, um, making sure that we're providing services to customers that they're used to receiving. We want to make sure we have a safe environment for our employees and for the public. Water supply, we're ensuring that we have adequate water to serve our customers now and into the future. Reliability and resiliency, we upgrade and manage our systems to make sure we're limiting service disruptions to our customers. Financial management, Aqua and OC have strong financial principles and currently have the highest bond ratings. And then regulatory compliance, uh, we are making sure that we're complying with Department of Environmental Quality regulations and everything we're doing. So, uh, Of those, there's three categories that our capital program fits primarily in, water supply, reliability and resiliency, and regulatory compliance. So if you look at our program, it's total it's 1.57 billion over the five years. Water is the largest component at 1.1 billion, and a lot of that's due to our water supply improvements that we're undertaking. Wastewater is about 429 million, and then solid waste is about 20 million dollars over the five years. So if we go into each individual category, um, here's just a quick pic picture of where we were um, about 60 years ago with the first Atoka pipeline. Um, this was the last stick that was laid in 1962. 
um, in Tupelo, Oklahoma, of the 100-mile, 60-inch pipeline that we built. So what we're doing um, in the capital program, uh, you can see over there on the left is um, how, how much we're doing each year, and then on the right is the pie chart showing um, what type of improvements we're doing. Water supply is indicated as a big component, uh, about $766 million. Reliability and resiliency is $343 million, and then uh, general type improvements are about $11 million. So if we look at our water supply, just to do a quick background of what our system is now. So you can see Oklahoma City there in the center, and the map generally spans from northwest Oklahoma to southeast Oklahoma. So Oklahoma City gets water from two sources generally, the North Canadian system from western Oklahoma, which consists of the North Canadian River, and then three reservoirs, Canton, Hefner, and Overholzer. And then from the southeast system, um, we have three reservoirs, uh, Stanley Draper, uh, which gets water pumped to it from Atoka, and then also the McGee Creek Reservoir. And then there's a 100-mile existing 60-inch Atoka pipeline I mentioned, and the 13-mile McGee Creek pipeline. And then uh, future improvements that we're working towards is getting additional water from the Kayamichi River Basin. So within this program, what we're looking at is the 72-inch pipeline um, building from the Atoka Reservoir, paralleling our existing 60 generally, up to Stanley Draper Reservoir. Uh, this is critical for us to get this done now because of, it allows us to get through drought periods when our system might be more challenged, um, and it allows us to move all of our existing water rights up to Oklahoma City. Uh, that, that pipeline we're currently in the process of procuring. Uh, start of construction, we're looking in 2019 um, when we can bid our first phase, and then uh, bidding phases throughout the five-year CIP, but hope to get construction done in 2025. And the total program for that, as I mentioned, is about $766 million. So. Now, if we look at the stuff we're doing inside the city, so here's an overview of, of, of the city, obviously, um, where we're bringing in this, the new 72-inch pipeline into Stanley Draper Reservoir. And currently, we have three main water treatment plants. Um, on the north side, you have Hefner, Overholzer in the center, and Draper on the southeast. Overholzer uh, was installed in the early 1900s, is in, uh, reached its end of its useful life. So we're going to be de decommissioning that. Um, and then we have the two main reservoirs, or excuse me, two main treatment plants, Hefner, uh, which generally serves northwest Oklahoma City, and then uh, Draper, which serves uh, south and east. Um, those have fairly defined service areas, but there is a little bit blending depending on season. So one of our main components is to build upon our existing transmission infrastructure and interconnect those two systems to give us a little bit more re resiliency should we have an impact on one of those systems. So if one of the plants went down, we'd be able to serve the majority of the city through the other. Um, so, going back, you can see over there in the blues, we have a lot of those pipelines in construction, and then um, that's the western interconnect component. We will also, outside the five-year CIP, doing the eastern interconnect um, to further that, that improvement. We're also doing work at our, um, within our, at two major booster stations, 8 and 15, and then you can see in yellow the replacement projects we're doing, doing facility, and then we're also going to be doing work um, at the overall plant, figure out what's the best way for us to use that. That's also where our line maintenance facility is, so we're going to look to improve that there with an operations center. And then we're doing work at both Hefner and Draper as part of this capital plan. Um, talked a little bit about the interconnect. allows for increased uh, resiliency for our system, and the growth of supply will be coming from the southeast, so we'll need to move more of that water to other parts of the city. At the plants, Draper, we're, one of the big improvements we're doing is improving our finished water storage. And then at Hefner, we're upgrading chemical feed systems, working towards emergency power generation and other improvements, and um, making sure we're meet, maintaining high levels of treatment. For main replacements, we're going to be doing about eight miles a year um, within this five year. And then as we get out past some of these big capital improvements, we'll look to increase that and do more main replacements. So if we move on to the wastewater side of our capital plan, it's about $428 million. Um, we have a, a peak there in 2020, and that's for one, an expansion of our South Canadian plant. Uh, reliability and resiliency is about $300 million of the program. Regulatory, just under $100 million, and then a little bit for general improvements. So if we look at where we're doing improvements throughout the city, um, you can see here our system uh, with the drainage basin zone. We have four major wastewater treatment plants, two on the very north side, uh, Deer Creek and Chisholm. And then in the northeast, we have North Canadian, and then on the south, South Canadian. We're going to be doing work at several lift stations without, throughout the city, in addition, sorry, in addition to our wastewater treatment plants. Um, 
doing replacement projects uh, developed based on work order histories as we do assessments of our system. And then we'll be doing a few capital, or excuse me, relief main projects uh, necessary to meet uh, DEQ requirements. So. so when we talk about the reliability and resiliency, one thing we didn't show on the previous map was our asset management program. We're improving on the way we're going to operate our system. We're going to be a, look to be more proactive. And as that, we've got a couple components. Condition assessment, we'll be going out and assessing every piece of pipe in our system. It's going to be something we do over an eight-year period, but that'll give us actual infield data to know that we're prioritizing our work appropriately and replacing what we need to. Survey and inventory, we'll go out and collect detailed information on where all our assets are so that way our, our infield people can manage our systems better. And then monitoring abatement, we'll look at where the flow is coming from and then look to eliminate that extraneous flow so that way we're not treating it and not conveying it, which will reduce our, our cost for operation. Um, treatment plan upgrades, we're going to be doing projects um, at North Canadian Deer Creek and Chisholm for our like, resiliency. Those plants were constructed in the late 70s, early 80s, and so we'll need to be doing some improvements there to maintain our high levels of treatment. And then uh, main replacements we'll be doing about 16 miles per year. If we look at what we're doing as far as regulatory compliance, mentioned the South Canadian expansion. Um, we need to increase the capacity of that due to flows coming to the plant and then also new discharge limits based on um, stream modeling that was done by the DQ. We're in design of that now. We're supposed to start construction in 2020 and be done by 2022. And then for the relief mains, uh, we're doing those to reduce the likelihood of, overhead, of overflows in the North Canadian and South Canadian basins, and those are driven by our consent order. On to the solid waste component of our capital plan. Um, this one is $20 million over the five years, and it's fairly consistent over each year, just uh, doing carts and equipment replacement, keeping, making sure we're doing collection. Um, so a little bit smaller than our other two programs. If it's one of the th key things that we just completed as part of our solid waste program was the implementation of our new uh, improved curbside recycling where we did the large bins. We implemented that in summer 2018, uh, serving urban customers and look to evaluate that as uh, growth and density occurs. So with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Talked about the interconnectivity between Hefner and Draper. Can you give the council some perspective on the timeline? And more importantly, when we get into drought conditions, what will that mean for Lake Hefner? Uh, yes. Um, so the, the goal is, as our, our system grows and our demand grows, we're not getting any additional supply from the North Canadian system. So we'll look to uh, manage, balance our lakes and try to manage it to where we're moving more water from the southeast where it's plentiful. Um, so that way we can conserve water in that lake to uh, meet customer demands during higher, higher demand periods, drought periods. So we'll, we'll use it, the Hefner water treatment plant more as kind of like a peaking plant. Okay. And as far as the construction goes between, uh, you know. The, um, yes. Yeah. Uh, when, when is that probably going to be done? For the, it'll be a program that actually expands for the Eastern Connect component to, it'll expand out past our current five year, but the Western Interconnect component, the yeah. lines we showed in blue, uh, we're looking to get all of those, five of the eight segments are in construction now. The remaining three will get in construction this fiscal year and will be done hopefully before the beginning of uh, 2022 fiscal year, so. 2022? Yeah, so. Okay. And that, and the. I beg your pardon, 2021, excuse me. 2021, yes, okay. Sir. And then um, those are for the, the whole thing. That'll be so, so, and the last section will be the northernmost section, right? That will address the, the western interconnect component that we're looking to do. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Can you remind me one more time, is that connection potable or non-potable? Potable. Potable, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Doug, do you want to summarize the schedule on that? Right. So, uh, in two weeks, we will we'll, uh, return for adoption of the plan uh, that it was presented again uh, a number of meetings ago. Uh, I don't believe we're going to have any department reports. Uh, we've had uh, other Three departments. If, if there are questions that you have about specific aspects of the plan, we'd be happy to bring back more information on that. Uh, we will have a recommendation from the Planning Commission as well in two weeks. Next up is a report on the uh, year-end performance report. This was uh, brought to Council a couple of weeks ago, but again, because of the time of that meeting, we did not do any presentations on it. So 
it's a, a big deal. We may spend a lot of time here, but with scooters and, and home sharing, but we got a lot of people out in the organization spending a lot of other time, uh, most of their time on a lot of other priorities. And so with that, uh, Doug's just going to hit some of the highlights on the year-end performance report. Right. This is, format is very similar to what we produced with the budget book. It's in the same structure. And so I'm just going to kind of hit one example on page from uh, Parks, uh, page 82. Uh, you can see this one kind of has a nice blend here. At the top of the page here, uh, we've got the uh, issue. Uh, the, they, each department identifies issues that they're facing over the next two to five years, so their issue is creating new service areas is one of their issues. They've got a description of that. And then they've got a, the strategies that they're uh, using to address that issue, as well as then their strategic results uh, to measure progress against that issue. And uh, again, you can see the data for FY16. There's 17, 18 actuals. We have a target for what, what they attempted or what they were working towards in 18, and then their target for FY19. The section below that in white, uh, each of these sections uh, is, uh, is there for each program within each department. So here's the administrative line of business, the executive leadership program for the Parks Department the little key symbol, each program picks out a key measure that they are working towards, that's the, the primary measure for them. In executive leadership, they're looking at the number of measures achieved, uh, and we can see, again, their performance across those various years. You'll also notice as we move down a little bit further to measure 771, the little symbol there that corresponds with the council priority to improve recreational opportunities and health and wellness. You can see at the bottom of the page, we've got each of the various council priorities, a little icon for those. If you're not sure which one is which, page one uh, gives the description of each of the priorities. So these are the measures that have been called out during the council priority, uh, and these are what departments are presenting on periodically as we bring those updates to you. This was also one of the presentations that was bumped when we had several long meetings, was on recreational opportunities and health and wellness. So again, the percent of citizens visiting a park or participating in a park program. You can see we've uh, bumped up from 72% in FY16 to 81 in 17, held fairly steady there at 78 in FY18. That's from our annual citizen survey. Uh, and so we've got a goal to improve that to 80% in the coming year. So that's just kind of a quick overview of what's in the, uh, uh, the report. There's uh, measures for each of the departments and then each, within each department, the specific programs that they use to uh, implement their, their programs. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. There. All right. Thank you, Doug. Next up, we do have a sales and use tax report uh, for October. And if you look at it, again, it's masked a little bit because of the increase of the sales tax rate. But the key number to take a look at on that is the year-to-date percent over projections. And we're 1.7 percent over projections for sales tax. So that's that's a solid number. That's very very good. Um, we're 18.3 overall, but again, that's mass because of the rate increase. But the real interesting number to me is on the other page is on the use tax. If you take a look at the use tax, it's up 27.8 uh, percent over projections, and that's because of additional collections on the internet. The internet collections go into the use tax. So if you're wondering, are we, are we getting uh, uh, collections on, on, on the internet, the answer is yes. Are we getting everything on there? I'm not sure we're ever going to really know, but there's been a lot of steps to get more collections on the internet. So we're very pleased uh, with the progress that that's taken. And that's, a lot of things have happened. There's some state law that was passed. There was Nexus that was established with, with Amazon when they came to the state. There's also some changes uh, regarding their third party challenges. There was the South Dakota case that was that was heard in the Supreme Court this summer that changed uh, some things to, for some others, and so amongst all those things uh, are reflected in the increase in, in, in the internet collections that are reflected in the use tax. Also, we have a report on EMSA, on the uh, on the EMSA care program that's out there. It's the third year in a row that the residential individual household portions of EMSA care have increased. Now, there's also been growth in the system, so the percent of those systems has really become pretty, pretty flat at 70, 72%, but that has stabilized, and what that has allowed us to do is we are projecting that at least through fiscal year 21, we'll be able to maintain the present rate 
a three dollars and sixty five cents. So that's kind of stabilized, and uh, so we feel pretty good about uh, about that. Who knows what's going to happen in three or four years down the road? But right now, it's in a pretty stable situation as we go forward. And with that, I'd be happy to answer questions on those or any other reports that are in the packet today. Any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Couch. And that brings us to item 13, citizens to be heard. Is there anyone here? We have no one who's signed up. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? All right, we will head into executive session to con consider item 9V, and then we will return.